Trump is an anti-Semite, always has been an anti-Semite, always will be an anti-Semite, and he has now doubled down on his latest appalling, disqualifying anti-Semitism. I think that the Democrats have been very, very opposed to Jewish people. That's true. And to Israel. All you have to do is look at Senator Schumer. What he did with Israel is a disgrace. And I think Israel will probably not forget it very soon. That was late yesterday. This was Monday. Why do the Democrats hate Bibi Netanyahu? I actually think they hate Israel. Yes. I don't think they hate him. I think they hate Israel. And the Democrat Party hates Israel. I really believe they hate Israel. Any Jewish person that votes for Democrats uh, hates their religion. They hate everything about Israel. And they should be ashamed of themselves because Israel will be destroyed. And this was 2019. In my opinion, you vote for a Democrat, you're being very disloyal to Jewish people, and you're being very disloyal to Israel. It is the fundamental trope of anti-Semitism, and it is always the first excuse for everything on the scale from gentlemen's agreements to pogroms to the Holocaust. It is the baseline belief Trump has shown throughout his life that Jews are loyal not to their country, but to something or somewhere else, Judaism or Israel or both. And last September, it was Trump at the fake union rally in Detroit telling them and his social media cult, join the ultimate strike against the globalist class. And in 2022, it was Trump saying that American Jews, quote, have to get their act together before it is too late. And on Hanukkah at the White House, it was Trump telling the crowd about your country. And the crowd was Americans, but Trump meant Israel. And in 2018, it was Trump telling General John Kelly that Hitler did good things. And it was in 1990 that Ivana Trump told her lawyer that Trump kept a book of Hitler's speeches in a cabinet by his bed. And Trump got all flustered and confirmed he had the book and he kept it by his bed. But it's not like he bought it. And of course, he never read it, even though he has now introduced new Hitler ploys as recently as this past weekend. The whole January 6th hostages. That's just a replay of how Hitler used to talk about Nazi party members who had been jailed. And his reverence for Ashley Babbitt, that's just a replay of Hitler's constant invocation of horse vessel shot by the communists. And the idea of having a second national anthem that only he plays, that's just the co-anthem of Germany until 1945, the horse vessel song. I don't know how this could be any clearer. Whatever the deeper psychology of Trump from being a disturbed and apparently homicidal child through adulthood and now into old age when some deterioration has been added to this fatal mix, there is a simple through line. He craves money. He craves power. He does not feel alive without both. Everything and everyone else he pretends to like and love, he does so because he believes it or they can get him money and power. There are no other genuine emotions. There are no restraints. There is no consciousness of guilt. There is no remorse. There is no fear of getting caught. If Trump could win this election by imprisoning America's Jews, he would do it. If he could win the election by forcibly converting the Gentiles to Judaism, he'd do that. And therein lies the ultimate danger of Trump's particular version of anti-Semitism. It is amoral. He can switch it on or off as the moment requires. Today, he is defending Jews and claiming his political opponents are attacking them and endangering their country. Tomorrow, he will again be insisting that they are endangering him by being loyal to their country. Of the thousand different madnesses of Trump... This may be the most dangerous one. We now know Trump's argument to the Supreme Court defending his fabrication of this fantastical nonsense that is presidential immunity. 
Namely, you cannot prosecute a former president because nobody ever has. Dress it up with a lot of legal jargon at $1,500 per billable hour all you want, but that's what it is. Quote, from 1789 to 2023 begins John Sowers' 51 pages of extremely creative writing submitted last night to the Supreme Court. No former or current president faced criminal charges for his official acts for good reason. This same logic proves that we can never have a woman president because there has never been one. For that matter, we can never have a Republican president serve non-consecutive terms because we've never had one. There is a reason no ex-president has faced criminal charges, and the reason is Ford pardoned Nixon. They both knew he was liable for indictment and prosecution. Nixon tried to rationalize actually going to prison by saying a lot of great writing has been done there. Once our nation crosses this Rubicon, every future president will face de facto blackmail and extortion while in office and will be harassed by politically motivated prosecution after leaving office over his most sensitive and controversial decisions, unquote. Even though none of that has happened. Not to Ford, who followed Nixon. Not to Carter, who followed both of them. We have a 13th Amendment because Abraham Lincoln, as he finished winning the Civil War, feared that many of his emergency acts during that war, including the emancipation of the slaves, might in peacetime be overturned by the courts. But so what? It sounds good. Trump believes in no laws. He hires lawyers who get paid whether he loses or not. I mean, Alina Habba. And he is confident he has hired Supreme Court judges who owe him. So like every other Republican, just more loudly, and like every other Republican, just more baldly, and just like every other Republican, just more dangerously, Trump decides on the outcome he wants and then makes up whatever rationale he needs. Based on voluminous information available to President Trump in his official capacity, reads a part of page five of the immunity imagination brief, the election was tainted by extensive fraud and irregularities, unquote. Voluminous information, not factual information, doesn't say factual, just says voluminous. Just big, thick manila folders of information like Nine days before he was inaugurated, those manila folders stacked high on the table in front of him at his press conference, full of all those documents he had signed, turning over all his business interests to all his sons, which he hadn't signed because there weren't any documents, because he didn't turn over his businesses, and he wouldn't let anybody look inside the manila folders because the pages were blank. But the information was voluminous. And I continue to think that the best answer to the entire presidential immunity bullshit is to remind the justices that they would be turning the president into an untouchable monarch. And that the moment they issued such a ruling, Joe Biden could arrest any of them he didn't like and arrest Trump and arrest any Trump supporter he didn't like, and jail them all indefinitely and cancel the election. And as long as he could make it happen, he could always get away with it. Try that out at $1,500 per billable hour. Oh, and there's a new Trump court case. And I think I already see the outcome of this one. It has been filed. It has been publicized. The Trump thugs have threatened lives about it. And the last time you will hear about this case is maybe this weekend or maybe right now. It will vanish without a trace. And then it will be like those 2017 Manila folders. Oh, right. He did do that. Most people fell for it. He has sued ABC and George Stephanopoulos for defamation because during Nancy Mace's implosion on this week, Stephanopoulos said Trump had raped E. Jean Carroll. The Trump defense remains, to paraphrase, that Trump was not found guilty of penetrating her 
with his penis, only with his finger. Trump, that may not be the flex you think it is, especially since it implies that she was unable to physically tell uh, the difference. And now that rarest of events wherein I thank Trump for giving me a fresh news hook on an old story. What's your reaction to Vice President Pence saying that he's being Oh, I couldn't care less. I couldn't care less. We need patriots. We need strong people in our country. We need strong people in this country. We don't need weak people. Trump late yesterday finally reacting to his own vice president saying he is not going to support him. And the short version is Mike Pence's comments are a shock. Because typically when Trump tries to defame another Republican or destroy another Republican or get another Republican killed, they end up endorsing him. The long version is a little bit more important because of the Stalin rule. The Stalin rule is rule number six out of the seven rules for dealing with autocrats and their enablers by Trig V. Olson of Viking Strategies, and I am indebted to Mr. Olson for letting me read his rules verbatim here. He developed these for his international work deploying around the world to train activists fighting for democracy in places like Belarus and Vilnius and Ukraine and Georgia and parts of Central Asia. And if we don't stop Trump, Trig V. Olson will be training activists to try to restore democracy here. So listen carefully, and in your mind, buy Mike Pence a drink. You can always kick him in the nethers later. Seven rules for dealing with autocrats and their enablers by Trig V. Olson. Rule number one, play the game you are in, not the one you wish or want to play. This means when one side is playing the zero-sum, illiberal game, there is no win-win to be played. You will either win and democracy survives, or you lose to the autocratic forces. Rule number two, always speak truth to power, because you never know the tipping point. You must confront the big lies of illiberal forces by speaking truth to their base of power, the people. There is a tipping point where your truth or the big lies prevail. Rule number three, don't hand the autocrats battering rams with which to beat you. The game you are in, the battle you are fighting, isn't about policy or ideology. They will use what you say to divide you from your allies, who you need to win the battle for democracy. Editor's note, he wrote this before Ian Bremmer clutched his pearls about Trump's bloodbath remark. Rule number four, understand authoritarians must live in a truth-free present. The past presents truths about the big lies and fear the illiberal forces use. The future for autocratic forces only matters for maintaining power at the moment. They only care about keeping power slash gaining power. Rule number five, practice zero-sum judo. Use their tactics against them. Big truths, marginalization, make them dependent, mock the disinformation, divide and conquer their power structure. Use their desire for the legitimacy of democracy against them. Rule number six, the Stalin rule. This is the Pence part. Stand together with anyone who will join you to disturb, disrupt, and diminish the illiberal structures. Even if you share nothing in common beyond a love of democracy and how much you loathe their politics in normal times, you fight side by side with them. It's the Pence part. We have already seen it accomplished in the Liz Cheney part. Rule number seven of seven. Wake up every day thinking, where can the vertical power structure be exposed, confronted, and destabilized? Each of us and all of us on Team Democracy must wake up every day and ask, 
what can I do to be on the side of restoring faith and confront the fear they use? Ultimately, writes Olson, I am an optimist when the fear of the illiberal autocrat erodes because people show they are not afraid. Faith takes hold and others want and will join the fight. It is one we must win in America. It is one we will win because more Americans stand for democracy that has made us great than for an autocrat who is constantly tearing us apart and down. Thank you, Trig V. Olson. Thank you, Main Street Research. Polls. The good news is, and I've deliberately put this last, this might be the start of the run on the polling bank. Biden 47, Trump 45, new poll from Main Street Research and Florida Atlantic University last Thursday through Sunday. Their previous poll was February 3rd, and it had been Trump 45, Biden 41. Now, Biden 47, Trump 45. Six points moving not from Trump to Biden, six points moving from undecided to Biden. Exactly as the Biden campaign had predicted once Trump locked up the Republican nomination. Biden 47, Trump 45. That's the good news. The bad news? The 538 pollster rankings has Main Street FAU as the 85th best poll in the nation. The good news? That's 85 out of 277. As we did our best to not make too much out of the very recent mind-numbing bad polls, so too should we not make too much of the even more recent heartwarming good polls. Unless this is the start of the new wave, in which case, you heard it here first! Also of interest here, a liberal New York Times columnist tells a crowd that the paper does not have... Enough conservative columnists, and no, the crowd was not in this Ohio diner. And the latest on Rupert Murdoch's fabricated story about me and Trump, and if you're tired of me talking about stochastic terrorist death threats, sorry, now I got one. That's next. This is Countdown. This is Countdown with Keith Oberman. ahead of us on this edition of Countdown. Hey, it's Trump's anniversary. Not exactly, but Saturday will be one year since his latest wave of terrorist threats began, directed stochastically at first towards the district attorney of Manhattan County here in New York, Alvin Bragg. The threats have gradually expanded to, well, anybody who's thwarted him. I mean, he is a psychopath. He has standards he is expected to live up to as a psychopath. And now they have extended, by extension, to me. Again. Details on that, and instead of things I promise not to tell, it's things I need to remind you about next. First, still more idiots to talk about. The daily roundup of the miscreants, morons, and Dunning-Kruger effect specimens who constitute today's worst persons in the world. First, the bronze. Worse. Mark Levin. Mark Levin is that high-pitched sound you may hear on some deluded relative's radio or on the weekends on Fox. He looks like he hasn't slept since 1973. He sounds like he's been ignoring advice to get his deviated septum fixed since at least that far back. Poor Mark Levin is the standard fascist blusterer, except periodically he says the funniest things, the most revelatory things, without ever knowing he's done it. And he's done it again. Why are there no Republican multi-billionaires? He asked on Nazi Twitter, offering to lend President Trump 
the money to file the funds to file his appeal in the outrageous case in New York State. Are none of them liquid enough to help or join with others to help? This is an outrage. There are so many unconscious confessions here, it's hard to know where to start. First of all, wait, isn't Trump a Republican multi-billionaire? Doesn't he have this money? Like his attorney said like a month ago that he had the money? Then there's the fact that Mark thinks he's asking a rhetorical question here when he's not. Why are there no Republican multi-billionaires offering to lend Donald Trump $465 million to lend him that much money? Maybe, Mark, because they don't think he would pay them back. <laughs> Lend. Oh, Mark Levin, you cracked me up. Thank you. I needed the laugh today. The runner-up, Worser, CNN, and good old David Zaslav. Some good news for cable TV news viewers. CNN is going to air one hour less of its weekend drek. The bad news is that's because it's going to instead play reruns of the Bill Maher show. Starting this Saturday, Bill Maher's show, which in case you're saying, oh, I remember Bill Maher, he's still on? It runs live on HBO on Friday nights. It will now run, as well, a day late, and thus a full day out of date, with commercials inserted somehow, on CNN at 8 p.m. Saturday. This is clearly the result of Mars' signal ratings triumph during the Chris Licht era at CNN when they took Mars' online post-show panel discussion and aired it on CNN on Friday night at about 11.30. That started last year about this time of year, and all I could find out about how it did in the ratings was that on April 17th, 2023, every other hour on Fox and MSNBC that night drew at least one million viewers per show every other hour. CNN, Friday night at 11, the Bill Maher hour, 277,000 viewers. 277,000. And that was for a show from the same night recorded literally minutes earlier and not previously seen on cable TV. The real motivation for doing this is actually a little bit more cynical than, oh, I'm sure this will work. God, something's got to work. Even though all the CNN executives who tried Bill Maher last year are working elsewhere this year, the upper managers of that company, and I forget what it's called, Zaslav Land, they know they are not going to draw flies with a day-old political insight and comedy show based on what Bill Maher read this week in the columns of Barry Weiss and Maureen Dowd and George Will. In other words, they're not going to get any ratings from a political insight and comedy show without any comedy and without any insight. They're doing it because they inexplicably just re-signed Marr to a two-year contract extension and putting his rerun on at 8 p.m. on Saturday nights on CNN is called amortizing. Even if it literally draws like... 250 viewers. The point is the costs at CNN for the 8 p.m. Saturday hour have just been reduced from like a million dollars at least to however much it costs to pay the guy who presses that one bar button that reads play. Now, I got an idea for CNN and Zaslav. Maybe they could get this uh, Don Lemon new online interview series like that one with uh, Elon Musk, Partai Clyde, Ketamine Gene. Run them Don Lemon interviews on Saturday at 8 p.m. Wait, there's a flaw somewhere in that idea. I just can't put my finger on it. But our winner, the worst, Nick Kristoff of the New York Times, editorial columnist, very earnest, very earnest guy. And like the rest of them, he is receding slowly from reality into that hiding place, that craven haven that news organizations that have lost the plot go. The, if everybody hates us, we must be doing it right. That is rarely true. When everybody hates you, it usually just means you are trying to appease people who will always hate you, and you are failing the people who want to not hate you. That's where the New York Times is. Get this. Politico reports that at something called the Faith Angle Forum in Florida, Kristoff has told the audience there that the Times made a mistake in firing the former editorial page editor James Bennett 
If you can't place that name, he was the bozo who gave Senator Tom Cotton space in the New York Times to portray the relatively minor looting that accompanied the 2020 Black Lives Matter protests as lawlessness and riots that were carnivals for the thrill-seeking rich. It was racist, it was inaccurate, and it read like the description of the action in a Tom and Jerry cartoon. A Tom Cotton and Jerry cartoon. And Tom Cotton topped it off by demanding that Trump send in troops to stop the out-of-control violence in New York City. What he should have done is write an op-ed demanding that Trump send in troops to feed and teach the kids of Arkansas who get the 43rd best education and the 43rd best child health care in the nation with Tom Cotton as their idiot senator. Anywho, apart from defending the editor who let that pile of crap publish that pile of crap, Nick Kristof also said the Times needed more right-wing columnists. Quote, I think we would be better off if we had really tough, more conservative opinion pieces and letters to the editor, adding the Times would have more credibility as a news organization. First of all, wait, 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 wait. The Times still publishes letters to the editor? Like, like letters to the editor? From before the internet was invented? to provide the single rarest thing in the America of 2024, a place somewhere where people well-informed or under-informed or just totally uninformed can express their nitwitted opinions? Because there is no platform now for these people. No place to make public their, what should we call them? Their comments. Holy cow, letters to the editor? Does the Times still publish a sunrise and sunset table, too? Yesterday's weather details? The full results from all the horse races? I mean, the Times killed its sports section, but it's still publishing letters to the editor. Greta Van Yonkers, Yonkers. Dear editor, I have been reading your newspaper since the year 1857. And I want to object to the recent introduction of crossword puzzles. That's not journalism. President Buchanan will hear about this. But of course, the headline in this story is Christoph wants more conservatives in the New York Times. I do think we can be wrong on a lot of things or we can miss important arguments. Like what? Like how Trump should be anointed king and we shouldn't have any more elections? Like how we should send in federal troops to reinstate sharecropping in Arkansas at gunpoint? Exactly who do you think conservatives are today, Mr. Kristoff? That's one point. The Times, and most of that ever-decreasing bubble of media, not threatened with imminent extinction, the Times has utterly no connection to reality anymore. What used to be conservatives have split into two groups. Former Republicans who are trying hard to stop Trump at all costs, and bluntly, most of them are trying harder to stop him than we are. That's one group. The other group of former Republicans are now Nazis. There's almost nobody else. At least half of the Tea Party, the rabid dogs of 2010, at least half the Tea Party is now part of the resistance. Nikki Haley was Tea Party. You want columns from them? Or do you want more Tom Cotton? Or do you want a nice piece written by Marjorie Taylor Greene using a crayon wedged into her three-toed feet? The Times lists 18 editorial columnists. Charles M. Blow, Jamel Bowie, Gail Collins, Michelle Goldberg, Carlos Lozada, Dr. Tressy mcmillan Cottom, Lydia Polgreen, and Zainab Tufeki. They're pretty reliable and informed liberals. That's eight. Then there's David Brooks, Ross Douthat, Doubt That, Doubt That, and Brett Stevens. They are flaming conservatives who often produce columns befitting that title. They should have been burned instead of published. David French is a conservative. Okay. Pamela Paul is an abomination, and I think her bosses think she's kind of a liberal. And her bosses are sure that Thomas Friedman, Paul Krugman, Maureen Dowd, and the we don't have enough conservative guys, Mr. Kristoff, they are sure that those four are liberal. In fact, you can no longer tell because basically all four of, them, four of them have fallen into this trap of writing almost exclusively about what they wrote about in 1999. 
I said this in a column 3,000 columns ago. And they and Ezra Klein are the masters of showing off just how liberal they actually are by making sure they write anything positive they can think of about conservatives, whether it's true or not. Final score, eight liberals, four conservatives, one nut job, five liberals who write like they get an extra five bucks every time they say something nice about conservatives and whose columns are as predictable as, well, as the sunrise and sunset tables, except when they make fools of themselves like the day Ezra Klein demanded the Democrats replace Biden. And it was clear from that column and the follow-up column apologizing for that column that neither Ezra nor any editor at the New York Times had any idea that the actual mechanism by which Biden could be replaced, if it had been a good idea, that that mechanism just did not exist. They did not know this. Eight liberals, 10 non-liberals of all stripes, 18 editorial columnists, and by the way, not one potential Hall of Famer. Not one you could not replace tomorrow. But ultimately, what drives me nuts about what Nick Kristoff has said is the Times is not the op-ed section. It's the whole newspaper. And every day, the whole newspaper, the whole New York Times is getting not more objective, but more timid, not more responsible, but more non-committal. Not more reportorial, but more as if they took that Twitter satirist, Doug J. Balloon, the guy who does New York Times pitch bot, and turned the infamous Times phrase in this Ohio diner into an emblem of the Times slowly dying under the weight of its new overarching ambition to be everything to everyone, but especially to the people who will never, ever, ever read the Times as if they took every New York Times pitch bot tweet and printed it out and slapped a cover on it reading New York Times style book. More conservative columnists. If the Times had any more conservative columnists and editors and reporters, or at least editors and reporters who are for some reason terrified of conservatives, if the Times increased its conservative footprint by like two more writers, it would have more conservatives producing the paper than reading it. And if this were a conservative nation, in the new Nazi sense of the word conservative, I guess this would make some sense, economically and editorially. But it's not. It's not a Nazi nation. And if it becomes one, the first thing its Fuhrer Trump and all his mini Fuhrers will do is burn down the goddamned New York Times to the ground. Should the Times opinion section be uniformly to the left of, say, me? No thanks. But if Nick Kristoff thinks there aren't enough conservatives writing in the Times, to say nothing of him not getting the point that letters to the editor stopped having any relevance at all in about 1999, if Nick Kristoff thinks there aren't enough conservatives making the Times look like the Wall Street Journal editorial page, just shut it down. Shut the paper down. You're pissing off your readership. And worse, you are betraying the truth and the nation. At least shut down the opinion pages. Again, what does America need now more than ever? More opinions. Fire all those people and replace their columns with their old columns. It would be at least three weeks before any reader noticed. Then fold the op-ed section and the opinion section and just run every result from every thoroughbred racetrack in America. That would mean less horse poop than you have now. Nick, more conservatives and more headlines questioning Biden's age instead of Trump's anti-Semitism and threats to arrest everybody he doesn't like, including you, Kristoff, today's worst person in the world in this Ohio diner! Instead of things I promise not to tell, I want to step back a year nearly. This upcoming is from last March 24th. It could just as easily be from March 24th, 2016, or any of the other March 24th since. Donald Trump is a terrorist, a stochastic terrorist, meaning he says something, and being a personal coward and also really good at getting other people to do things for him, other people make the threats and make the bombs. 
I want to go back to Trump and Alvin Bragg and why the only answer, no matter how long we delay answering it this way, the only answer to this is to charge Trump with terrorism and take him out of our society and keep him out of our society. Peacefully, lawfully, nonviolently, but get him the F out of here. As preface, if this episode of the podcast has seemed a little hurried or in some places sounded like I've been reading slowly, I've been busy all day dealing with the aftermath of how a fellow named Jeffrey Clark of Fox Digital started this lie that I was somehow in favor of the assassination of Trump when in fact I want Trump to be correct when he says he's been treated worse than Lincoln, namely by dying in prison after conviction. Jeffrey Clark, now that's an interesting coincidence. It's got to be a different Jeffrey Clark, doesn't it? Jeffrey Clark wrote his false version, and then somebody named Snajana, that's how it's spelled, no clue is the pronunciation, Snajana Farbarov, rewrote the piece in the New York Post, and they got what they wanted when they did this. My agents got a death threat against me. That's the point of this. Trump introduces political violence into this country. The Republicans shrug and thus enable it. The Democrats, oh, they clutch pearls and do nothing about it. And then Trump's whores at News Corp help hold up a sign pointing at whoever they want to cause trouble for. And some gutless psycho winds up directing a death threat at the guy standing next to me. Nice work, Jeffrey Clark. Nice work, S. Farberov. Nice work, guy who left the voicemail threat, which has a caller ID number <laughs> attached to it. If you know Donald, no, it's a different Donald. If you know Donald, thank him for me for being so stupid. Because, yes, as a practical matter, don't get alarmed. My first death threat was in L.A. in the early 90s. I said on KNX Radio that a Dodgers outfielder named Cal Daniels had loafed during a game. And I said this primarily because Cal hit a ball to third base, and the third baseman bobbled it, kicked it, chased it into foul territory, picked it up, looked forlornly around, and then found to his astonishment that Cal Daniels had never run out of the batter's box towards first base and was, in fact, walking back towards the Dodgers' dugout. A minute after I said Cal Daniels had loafed, the phone rang in the newsroom and they said, Elberman, it's for you. And a guy on the phone said, I know where your station is and I know when you leave and I'll be waiting out there to cut your tongue out for daring to criticize the Dodgers. And I told him, yeah, be there. You got the time right. Go ahead. I called the cops. I recorded my last show in advance and I left early just to be sure. That's what you do. There was the fake anthrax I told you about the other day, and there was pretty much a weekly threat of some kind throughout the second Bush administration. The most recent death threat, until now, was when the FBI told me a couple of years ago I was on the honorary mention list in the computer of the MAGA bomber, the guy who painted his hair on. More on that story presently. I will say that long ago it dawned on me that we have been heading toward the place we are in now a long time at least 35 years on this track. I'm not sure how we get back, if we get back, but we have to stop this by taking those who are causing this, those who are exploiting it, out of our society, peacefully and nonviolently, but not acquiescing any longer to what they do and what they have learned they can get away with doing from Trump. He didn't start this. He just figured out how to master it. And so they need to be taught a lesson, and the lesson is Trump goes to jail for life. The other thing I learned about this years ago, if you're going to get a death threat over something you said on radio, on television, on a podcast, on cable, in a movie, if you're going to get a death threat, it's probably better if you are dealing with it over things that matter, like whether we're going to live in a democracy or in a dictatorship in which the dictator ignores all the laws and gets other people to issue death threats on his behalf or gets other people to kill people on his behalf. It's better if your problems with death threats are over stuff like that than if they're about Cal Daniels of the L.A. Dodgers. If I told you Donald Trump was an animal who should be removed immediately, not removed from office, but just removed, 
If I told you Trump was, quote, doing the work of the devil. If I told you Trump was destroying our country, quote, as they tell us to be peaceful. If I showed you two pictures, one of Trump and next to it, one of me, and I'm holding a baseball bat about to swing it, posed exactly as Robert De Niro portraying Al Capone was in the movie The Untouchables just before he beat another character to death with a baseball bat. If I showed you 30 other social media posts I had made in 24 hours, each of them filled with threatening and violent and hateful language about Donald Trump, what would you think I was trying to tell you? What would you think I was hoping you would do. Donald Trump is a stochastic terrorist, and the Stormy Daniels case is legitimate but comparatively trivial, and the Jack Smith special counsel investigations are legitimate and anything but trivial, but Trump's posts yesterday about Alvin Bragg, the baseball bat photo post, and the post reading, quote, a Soros-backed animal, who just doesn't care about right or wrong, no matter how many people are hurt. And the Post reading, quote, this is the Gestapo, this is Russia and China, but worse. And the Post reading, quote, who should be removed immediately. These are terrorist threats. Terrorist threats made by Donald Trump on a public platform. Arrest him now for terrorism. And his intent... And his process and his awareness that his words will be interpreted by the most deranged of his cultists as calls, as instructions to kill Alvin Bragg and to kill Jack Smith and to kill Letitia James and to kill Fannie Willis. His awareness of all that process is undeniable because Trump has used stochastic terrorism to incite January 6th. And dozens and dozens of the violent insurrectionists of that day who attacked the Capitol said on trial under oath, most with a sense of surprise that everybody didn't already understand this, that they went to capture or kill senators and congressmen and a vice president and the media because Donald Trump told them to. Stochastic terrorism is often a vague thing. That is why it is used. You say something. Somebody else goes and kills or maims or destroys on your behalf, and you respond, I never told them to do that. It is the King Henry II excuse. Will no one rid me of this turbulent priest, said King Henry about the Archbishop of Canterbury on Christmas Day 1170. And four days later, Hugh de Morville, William de Tracy, Reginald Fitzers, and Richard Le Breton ran the Archbishop through with their swords. They, in 1170, then expressed surprise that everybody didn't already understand that their king had ordered them, or somebody, to kill the archbishop. The murderers were excommunicated and punished, and on the premise that since he was only making a rhetorical statement, not unlike District Attorney Bragg is a danger to our country and should be removed immediately, King Henry got the benefit of the doubt. And he served another 17 years as the King of England. But Trump has already lost that benefit of the doubt. He attacked the FBI last summer for executing a completely legal search warrant at Mar-a-Lago. Days later, a Trump fanatic tried to get into FBI headquarters in Cincinnati to kill FBI agents. That was Trump committing terrorism by proxy, stochastic terrorism. January 6th followed a series of tweets and posts and speeches and his screeching quote that morning. If you don't fight like hell, you're not going to have a country anymore. That was Trump committing terrorism by proxy, stochastic terrorism. Before the 2008 midterms, Trump attacked Democrats and liberals in a way never heard before in American politics. And Cesar Sayoc then sent pipe bombs to Joe Biden and Cory Booker and John Brennan and James Clapper and Hillary Clinton and Robert De Niro and Kamala Harris and Eric Holder and Barack Obama and George Soros and Tom Steyer and Maxine Waters. And a year later, when the FBI finally got through Sayoc's laptop, it turned out there was a second list of targets. And I know this because I was on that list. 
That was Trump committing terrorism by proxy, stochastic terrorism. And these social media rage tweets yesterday, primarily against Alvin Bragg, but mentioning James and Smith and Willis, they are implausibly deniable instructions to whoever is sick enough and violent enough and lost enough to accept them as what they were intended. Instructions. Trump told me to attack Alvin Bragg. Trump committing terrorism by proxy. Stochastic terrorism. This is going to have to stop, and it is going to have to stop immediately because of all the things that happened on January 6th, 2021. The one we talked the least about is the fact that this country on that day was extraordinarily goddamned lucky. Well, somebody's luck is going to run out. Ours or Trump's? And no, specifically, precisely, and exactly, nobody should attack Trump or menace Trump or shoot Trump or kill Trump or any Republican. But if the words that Trump wrote yesterday about Alvin Bragg were written about him, what would you think the writer meant? This is stochastic terrorism. This is not subtle stochastic terrorism, nor vague stochastic terrorism, nor gray area stochastic terrorism. The Department of Homeland Security and the Department of Justice need to act immediately ahead of the special prosecutor and with the same urgency with which one would approach the Republican cliche of 2003, the ticking nuclear time bomb in some American city. Charge, indict and arrest Trump and do it today. He is a stochastic terrorist. He must be stopped by the law, not by vigilantism nor terrorism. And he must be prosecuted and convicted by the law. Because as we have all seen for the last eight years, the moment you let a stochastic terrorist like Donald Trump get away with it once, the premise, will no one rid me of this turbulent prosecutor, reporter, Democrat, liberal, vice president, The premise of that becomes more and more normalized and more and more prevalent and more and more understood by the diseased minds that accept Trump's word as a message from their president. You do not have to thrust a knife into someone to be convicted of murder in this country. Ask Charles Manson. You do not have to have built a bomb nor thrown a bomb to go to jail because a bomb was built and thrown. Ask Kathy Wilkerson of the Weathermen. You do not have to have protested the building of Cop City in Georgia, nor even to have been there to be arrested and jailed without bond, asked DeKalb County District Attorney Sherry Boston. And you do not have to wait until somebody tries to hurt a man named Alvin Bragg to apprehend the creature who is inciting, insisting, demanding, encouraging, beseeching, instigating, instructing somebody, anybody to hurt him or hurt Letitia James, or hurt Jack Smith, or hurt Fannie Willis. Arrest Donald Trump today. And when he is arrested in New York or elsewhere or everywhere, the judge or judges must do two things. A complete gag order. Trump has lost his right to speak aloud in this nation. And... After his threats and his implorations, he has proven he is a material, lethal danger to the prosecutors and the witnesses and anyone who thwarts him. He wants them to be killed. He wants others to kill them. There must not be, there must never be, bail for Donald Trump. I've done all the damage I can do here for now. Thank you for listening. Countdown musical directors Brian Ray and John Philip Chanel arranged, produced, and performed most of our music. Mr. Ray was on the guitars, bass, and drums. Mr. Chanel handled orchestration and keyboards. It was produced by TKO Brothers. Other music, including some of the Beethoven compositions, were arranged and performed by the group No Horns Allowed. 
The sports music, if we play it again ever, is the Olderman theme from ESPN2, written by Mitch Warren Davis, courtesy of ESPN Inc. Our satirical and pithy musical comments are from Nancy Faust, the best baseball stadium organist ever. Our announcer today was my friend Stevie Van Zant. Everything else was pretty much my fault, but you knew that already. That's countdown for this 231st day until the 2024 presidential election, the 1,170th day since Dementia J. Trump's first attempted coup against the democratically elected government of the United States. Use the 14th Amendment and the not regularly given elector objection option. Use the Insurrection Act. Use the justice system. Use the mental health system to stop him from doing it again while we still can. The next scheduled countdown is tomorrow. Bulletins as the news warrants. Till then, I'm Keith Olbermann. Good morning, good afternoon, good night, and good luck.